to a Rook Lab podcast. In this podcast series, we talk to some of the most prominent researchers in the field of OCD and related disorders. My name is Volin Ivanov, and I am a psychologist and PhD student doing research on hoarding disorder. For today's episode, I'm at the Institute of Living in Hartford, Connecticut, and have met up with Dr. David Tolden. So welcome to our podcast series, David. Thank you, Volin. Dr. Tolden is a psychologist and also the director of the Anxiety Disorders Center and Center for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy at the Institute of Living. He's also an adjunct associate professor of psychiatry at Yale University. And some of you might also have familiarized yourselves uh, with him through TV shows such as The OCD Project and My Shopping Addiction. And the latter has the same theme as today's podcast, namely compulsive buying. So, Dr. Tolan, I guess most of our listeners do some shopping themselves, mm -hmm. but I guess compulsive buying is somewhat a different thing from that. Yeah, I mean, uh, compulsive buying, like most problems, can be thought of as being on a continuum from very, very mild up to very severe. And so uh, you know, with compulsive buying, I think what you see is an exaggerated version of something that all of us do. I mean, all of us obviously buy things. and and. At one time or another, we all probably buy some things that we don't need, and we probably buy some things that we can't really afford. And mm -hmm. in most cases, that doesn't cause very many problems for us. But there are some people, and, and it may be as much as you know, two to five percent of the population, where the behavior just spirals out of control, mm -hmm. and so they start buying things that they really can't afford, and then they can really start getting impaired by that behavior. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the, those are the, mo the, the main features of the disorder? Well, you know, the, the features of the disorder have never really been very clearly specified. I mean, compulsive buying is not listed in the dsm 4 and I don't believe it's, it's in the dsm 5 either, other than kind of brief mention. So there's no, there's no universally accepted list of diagnostic criteria. But when people have talked about it, what they have suggested is that it, it probably consists of, of two different aspects. One is mental and one is behavioral. Mentally, people with compulsive buying are described as being preoccupied with purchases, that they can't stop thinking about it, that they, um, they fantasize about things that they're going to buy, they, they plan their shopping trips, and that their, their, their brain is really focused on it. And then behaviorally, which is the most obvious sign of it, the person is engaging in this pattern of overspending that causes real financial problems for the person. So it's not just simply that they occasionally buy something that they can't afford, but you know, they really run into major debt or they end up having to sell off possessions or in some cases lose with the place that they live because they, they can't get their behavior under control. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the name compulsive buying implies that it probably is a compulsive disorder, but I see a lot of impulse control uh, problems in this disorder as well. Would you say that it's an impulse control disorder or a compulsive disorder? Well, it's a little, a little tough to tell. Um, I mean, the word compulsive gets thrown around to, for all kinds of things, and we talk about compulsive buying, we talk about compulsive gambling, some people talk about compulsive drinking, compulsive sex, compulsive internet use, and do those really, are those really compulsions? Part of the problem is that we don't have necessarily a universal consensus on exactly what compulsive means and exactly what impulsive means. Many uh, people have considered compulsive to mean a negatively reinforced behavior. That is, the person feels very bad, and when they engage in this behavior, they feel less bad, and therefore they want to keep doing it. And some people have described impulse behaviors as being associated with positive reinforcement, so it's an appetitive behavior. Buying has a little bit of elements of both. I mean, people who engage in compulsive buying will often describe a high or a great feeling when they buy something or when they find something that they want to buy. Now, that's very different from what you see in OCD. People with OCD typically don't describe pleasure at engaging in a compulsion. They don't necessarily um, describe a feeling of being high. You know, that's a much more clearly negatively reinforced set of behaviors. At the same time, though, people with compulsive buying also seem to be under some degree of negative reinforcement. That is, they tend to buy when they feel bored, when they feel lonely, when they feel sad, when they feel anxious or angry, and they do report that those feelings are reduced when they engage in buying behavior. So it, it, in some ways it has some features of compulsivity and it has some features of impulsivity. So maybe both of those factors are, are at play here. Yeah. 
Um, so how could compulsive buyers be distinguished from normal consumers and collectors? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that whenever you're trying to draw a line on a spectrum, you usually come back around to the level of functioning. You know, that many people engage in buying behavior and sometimes it's excessive and many people engage in what we might call retail therapy because that's what makes them feel good is to go shopping and there may be, may be no problem with that. It may be that it, it doesn't uh, cause any real problems for them, it doesn't impact their functioning and they can go on with things. Um, and yet at, on the other end of it if, if there are people whose spending and buying behavior has gotten to the point where they're now buying things that they realistically can't afford and that's causing them real problems in life, well then they might have crossed the line. Mm -hmm. Now one problem with that way of looking at it is that the line is in a different place depending on how much money you have, which would mean therefore that a poor person would cross the line into functional impairment faster than a rich person would. Is, does that mean that, that this is not the right place for us to draw the line? I, I think there's, the jury is still out on that. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for us to consider socioeconomic status in deciding whether a behavior is pathological or not? Mm -hmm. Some say yes, some say no. Yeah. And speaking of that, speaking of the link to, to other types of behavior, would you say that there is a link between compulsive buying and hoarding? Yeah, there's definitely a link. Um, not all people with compulsive buying engage in hoarding behavior, and not all people who hoard engage in compulsive buying behavior, but there does seem to be substantial overlap. We did a big study, um, a lot, my, my colleagues uh, Randy Frost and Gail Steckety and I uh, did a, a fairly large study in which we interviewed people for the presence of various psychiatric disorders, including the impulse control disorders, and what we found was that most of the people who hoarded would have met criteria for compulsive buying disorder if that was actually listed in the DSM. Now, what we don't know is, is does that mean that they had two problems or does it just mean that compulsive buying is kind of an, an, an essential feature of, of, um, of hoarding? Most people who hoard engage in some form of compulsive acquisition, whether it's buying or, or collecting free things. Mm -hmm. So, so certainly compulsive buying or compulsive acquiring is very, very big in hoarding. It seems to be a little bit less on the other side. When you look at a, a sample of compulsive buyers, many of them do engage in, in hoarding behavior, but, but many don't because they're not buying things in as much of a volume that it clutters the home. Here again, we have a bit of a complication. A person with a big house would be less likely to be called a hoarder, or it would take them longer to reach that point than somebody with a, a small house. Um, in, in some cases, they're not particularly concerned about owning the possession. For them, it's just the thrill of buying. We, we've seen lots of people who will buy things, and they just leave it in the closet with the tag still on. They, they have really no interest in actually wearing this item of clothing. Sometimes they'll even just give them away or, or try to get rid of them. Um, for them, it's, it's the thrill of the, the buying. So there's definitely a relationship. You know, how much overlap there is is not entirely clear, and, and even when we see the overlap, it's not entirely clear whether that's comorbidity or just the fact that we're looking at different aspects of, of mm -hmm. the same syndrome. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do we know anything about the neurobiology of compulsive buying? Mm -hmm. We know a little bit, um, and what we know about, about compulsive buying ties in nicely with what we know about the neurobiology of buying, period. Whenever you or I or anybody else is at a store or, or online and we're, we're contemplating a purchase, there are a couple of different areas of the brain that, that are heavily involved, and there's a bit of a push and a pull. The, the on the one side, <clears throat> you have um, the ventral striatum, and in particular the nucleus accumbens. And the ventral striatum nucleus accumbens is uh, heavily involved with reward anticipation. Uh, it, it's not necessarily that involved with the receipt of, of reward or the experience of reward. It's, it's much more the anticipation. So you are thinking this is going to be good. And so what we see is that, that as you come closer and closer to actually deciding to make a purchase, your nucleus accumbens is becoming more and more active. On the other side, you have the insula, which it tends to be tied in more with, with anxiety, and it, it tends to be more involved with kind of negative proprioception, 
So when you don't feel so good, it's kind of the insula um, that's, that's involved with that. The insula is kind of involved with, with deciding that, that certain things are too risky, too aversive, or, or so on. And so you, you can imagine that, that when you're sitting there trying to decide whether to buy something or not, that your nucleus accumbens and your insula are essentially battling it out in your brain. The, the nucleus accumbens is saying, buy it because it's going to be great, and the insula is saying, don't buy it because it's going to feel bad and this is risky. And when we look at people who have compulsive and, by, and this comes from the field of, of primarily in, in neuroeconomics, so this is even outside the mental health range. But there has been a study um, in which they, they uh, took people who had compulsive buying syndrome, uh, I can't quite call it disorder, but they had people who were engaged in compulsive buying and people who didn't, and they had them engage in some simulated buying decisions. And what they found was that people with compulsive buying had excessive activity in the nucleus accumbens, and they had low activity in the insula compared to people who didn't have compulsive buying. So it's the same brain regions that you and I use to make our financial and buying decisions, but essentially the accelerator is, is on too much and the brakes are too low. Mm -hmm. um, so this seems to be a substantial problem for a lot of people, and do we know anything about how this problem of compulsive buying can be treated and how it should be treated? We know a bit. Uh, there have been some studies uh, both in the U.S. and in Germany um, suggesting that cognitive behavior therapy is promising. Um, now, again, we're talking about a relatively small number of studies, uh, but they do suggest that most people who receive CBT for, for compulsive buying can, are considered to be treatment responders, and in most cases they show a substantial improvement in functioning. It does not necessarily mean that the problem has completely gone away, which I think you can say of most psychiatric disorders, that, that they get much better, but full remission is sort of, sort of rare. Um, on the pharmacotherapy side, it's a little bit less clear. Um, the, the last that I saw is that when we look at the SSRI antidepressants, there's been one uh, study uh, suggesting that SSRIs can uh, make a difference compared to placebo. But there have been about three studies that showed that it didn't. So I think that we're not seeing particularly favorable results overall for the SSRIs. There's been a very small amount of research using uh, naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. And naltrexone, it, that's kind of interesting when we think about that original question of is this a compulsion versus an impulse control problem. Naltrexone um, disrupts the processing of endogenous opioids. It essentially kills pleasure. Um, biologically, this is the medication that they might give you if you came into the emergency room with a heroin overdose because it essentially blocks the movement of opiates through your brain um, and it, you perk right up. Um, but we also see that if you apply naltrexone to a number of different impulse control problems, um, that the behavior decreases. Essentially, you're cutting off the reward. So naltrexone shows promise in treating people with drug addiction. It shows promise in treating people with alcohol addiction. It shows some promise in treating pathological gamblers, um, and it shows some promise in treating people who have compulsive buying. But again, it hasn't been subjected to the same kind of large-scale randomized controlled trials that CBT and the antidepressants have. Mm -hmm. So it's still very preliminary, but it's, it's intriguing to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some things are going on, and hopefully in a few years treatment will be more effective than it is today. I think that's the hope. Certainly we have a lot of people that are studying the phenomenon mm -hmm. and, and there are ongoing clinical trials that hopefully will get us closer to the answer. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So thank you so much for talking to me, Dr. Tolin. Well, thank you, Bowen. And uh, thank, to, uh, thank you to all our listeners. And uh, I hope that you don't forget to check out our website as well, rooklab.com, where you can follow our research endeavors and also listen to uh, other episodes of this podcast series.